Good afternoon and welcome to the UCL Lunch Hour Lectures. I'm delighted to introduce today Dr. Chris Van Tulliken, research scientist at UCL, funded by the Medical Research Council. Thank you very much, Sonia. Can everyone, can everyone hear me? I'm using this uh, little radio mic. Thank you all very much indeed for coming. Um, it's a great honour to be asked to speak at my own institution. I am... Uh, I work in a virology lab just across the road in the Cruciform Building, and I'm also an infectious diseases doctor, a registrar at University College Hospital. But I don't think that I've been asked to speak to... I don't know, actually, because I haven't been asked why I was asked to speak, but I don't think that anyone is expecting my penetrating insights into the effect of primate lentiviral accessory factors on innate immune signaling. If anyone is expecting that lecture, they can turn up next week and I'll give them the coursework afterwards. I think the reason I've been asked to speak is because this year I was nominated as one half of the best children's factual television presenting pair at the children's BAFTAs. You may laugh, you may laugh, but this caliber of presenting is what has secured Operation Ouch to BAFTAs. And uh, the children's BAFTAs are a little bit like the Scottish and the Welsh BAFTAs in that they are really BAFTAs, no matter what anyone else says. So I, I present facts to children, and uh, mainly about snot and feces, and this being a lunch, lunch hour lecture, that's partly what I'll be doing today. Um, I also present some grown-up programmes for the BBC on BBC One and on BBC Two. So I, I presented a few Horizons, I present a series called The Truth About on BBC One, um, and I present, uh, I co-present a series called Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, and sometimes I do those things with my identical twin, and sometimes I'm lucky enough to be able to do it without him. Um, this is really, then, a meta-talk. It's a piece of communication about science that's about how to communicate science. Um, it says in your blurb, I think, that I'm going I'm to cut through the confusion or I'm going to reduce the confusion. That isn't true. I'm going to amplify the confusion. And by the end, um, I want you to be left only with questions or possibly even feeling so discouraged that you don't have any questions left. I think that we are at a really interesting moment in science and in medicine and in the way we need to talk about science and medicine. It's not a crisis, but it's a bump in the road, and I, I think we're kind of turning a corner. So I want to reflect about some of the things that I've presented on the BBC and uh, a little bit about the science behind them, but I'm, I'm going to try and impart no real scientific information in contrast to most of the other lectures. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where I think that kind of television is going. I'm going to bookend this talk with two clips from um, a documentary that won a BAFTA for Best Documentary in the mid-90s, directed by Simon Singh. It was called Fermat's Last Theorem. And uh, it describes the story of a mathematician called Andrew Wiles solving a, a 360-odd-year-old proof that a French mathematician had written in the margin of a book. And are there any mathematicians here? Great. Um, so so the, the theorem more or less states that Pythagoras is only true for a squared power. So no other, if you, you cannot raise any other integers to, those, to, to any other power, and the formula will hold. So it's a story about the journey over 350 years to prove it. And I'm going I'm to show you a clip. Wonderful, isn't it? So uh, you can watch that all on YouTube. I'm going to show another clip at the end. And really, I'm showing these clips to contrast with the kind of films that I make. Because I try and explain facts, more or less. I make programs called things like The Truth About. Not always, but mostly. Occasionally, I'm filmed about something I actually know about. And I think there has never, ever been a more confusing time to try and consume information about health and the biosciences. And this is a bit odd, because science works, and I can't put it any better than, than Richard Dawkins. If you based the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. <laughs> For anyone who's offended, there was then quite a lengthy discussion about why he shouldn't have said that. I was deeply offended, but it, it's important. That, that this, is the, this is the area we're operating in. Science works, so it should be getting easier. We live in this age of astounding technological progress. So maybe 
the barrier is with the communicators. Certainly, uh, this article from a BMG, BMJ journal seems to think so. Um, uh, only 33% of the recommendations on the Dr. Oz show were supported by evidence. It's a shameful time to be a doctor presenting scientific and medical facts on television. But this is a Canadian article, actually, written about American television shows, the kind of shows that only an imbecile would ever go on. This is my identical twin brother on Dr. Oz. Um, actually, he did a very good uh, job of stemming the tide of panic about Ebola in the United States and endlessly repeating this fact that more Americans have been married to Kim Kardashian than have died of Ebola. Um, <laughs> so let's see if we do things better in Britain. I want to walk through some of the really big, important, pressing health issues, the most pressing issues of our age, really, like whether or not red wine is actually good for you. So this is a, a drink with enormous social, biological, medical effects. Is it good or bad for us? Now, it's almost hackneyed to turn to the Daily Mail. I know that, but, but just indulge me here. So we looked at, at red wine, and just, I'll just walk you through some of these headlines because they're lovely. Why is it good for you? How it can be slimming? How it can help you lose weight? How good is red wine for our health? I love it. It's very prejudicial language, isn't it? We already know it's good for us. The question is how good. Doctors prescribe red wine. Which is better, red wine or peanuts? I mean, this is a clinical dilemma we've all grappled with, <laughs> and it's nice of the Daily Mail to sort it out for us. And a few more headlines there. And the, the issue isn't just confirmed, confined to the Daily Mail. There is nothing that I or anyone else can say to underline the stupidity of this headline than simply reading it aloud. A glass of red wine is the equivalent of an hour at the gym. I've looked up uh, the paper behind this article, actually, and it was uh, written by, by some quite good scientists in Alberta. And, uh, and uh, they're very excited to be getting the mouse data into some human clinical, clinical trials soon. And uh, I think that's right, because whenever you read about wine, I think you have to, have to remember this. All of us, every single one of us, from uh, public health officials to members of the public to the people trying to sell you the wine, want wine to be good for us. Everyone, literally everyone. We've had 2,000 years of marketing about wine. Great. I wonder what units of equivalence he's proposing there. Is it joules or is it watts? So how do we, how do we get to this, this idea that maybe alcoholic drinks are good for us? Well, it's, it's actually the thing that piqued my interest was data from 1928. This was a scientist at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore who observed that there seemed to be a mortality benefit to moderate alcohol consumption. This graph, this is from a, a, then a recent meta-analysis, 2014. This is the curvilinear relationship. This is why we think it's good for us. Because however slightly that mortality, the risk of dying, dips a little bit as you drink a little bit more booze. And then it goes up again. So that's what underpins everything. So we set out to make a horizon to sort out the truth. And also to answer the question, how should you drink? Do you need a little holiday every week? Should you spread it out or can you just get drunk? So this, uh, just, uh, this is also a confessional talk. This is clearly an article by my brother in the Daily Mail adding to the general confusion. So we've had this 2,000 years of, of wine marketing. So Zand went to the Finger Lakes in upstate New York and he looked at these, uh, these Pinot Noir grapes and they contain this chemical resveratrol. And res resveratrol is uh, a natural phenol derivative. It's an antifungal. And Pinot Noir have very high concentrations because the grapes in Pinot Noir are tightly bunched. And they don't dry well. And they have thin skins. So they're prone to fungal infection. So they have very high quantities of it. And what we found is there's a lot of data from goldfish and mice and zebrafish and cellular studies that resveratrol is extremely good for you. Very, very good for you. It extends mortality. The human trial data is more limited because the amount of resveratrol you need to get the clinical benefits is about the amount of resveratrol in all the wine that he's lined up on these barrels here. Very hard to turn molecular studies into it. But we're very, very prepared to believe it because wine has this Eucharistic quality, doesn't it? So we kind of land in a place where if our grandmother had been hanging around with the scientists in Johns Hopkins in the 1920s, she probably would have said, yeah, yeah, wine might be good for some people and not so good for other people. And that's where the epidemiology has maybe got us. It's to, to something our grandmother could have figured out through the observations of her own life. We did uncover one hard truth. We tried to navigate our way through it, but um, alcohol is not a diuretic. 
And this paper is wonderful. It's from the 1980s. Uh, the consequences of drinking, it's mo moderate beer drinking, consequences of drinking six pints of beer um, were investigated in healthy medical students. I don't think six pints of beer is moderate at all. So alcohol, is it good for us? Is it bad for us? What's the answer, damn it? I can't tell you. I think, I think it's unlikely that ethanol has a beneficial physiological effect because we have pathways that can be very easily upregulated, that we would express more of it if it was beneficial. On the other hand, I probably wouldn't be married if it wasn't for the effects. <laughs> what about vitamins? These are good for us, right? So where do we get our vitamin information? How are we pre-prejudiced? Part of it is that double Nobel laureates uh, advocated, Nanus Pauling advocated massive megadosing of vitamin C. Part of it is tales of uh, polar explorers and other Arctic explorers uh, having terrible, terrible effects from vitamin deficiency. And part of it is our understanding of the consequences of vitamin deficiency in the deprived areas of the world. Can anyone say what's, what the issue with the child, uh, what, what medical condition or, or problems he might be suffering from? Anyone ask this to all my medical students? Malnutrition, yes, everyone, everyone can see that, the pot belly of malnutrition. In fact, he's an extremely well-nourished child. He's holding a clutch of crocodile eggs and a handful of cassava. He has malaria. But we are all amateur nutritional scientists because we know that in protein deficiency malnutrition, you get a pot belly. That's protein deficiency malnutrition. This is a child in Sudan with a pot belly. But look at the upper arm circumference on that child. So we have very, very powerful messaging coming to us from a very young age about the importance of vitamins and why they're good for us. And I think it starts with cereal packets. Everything's vitamin enriched. and We're given this marketing. And in fact, there's no confusion in the scientific data here. Um, the, the Annals of Internal Medicine published an editorial saying enough is enough. Stop wasting money on vitamin and mineral supplements. We, we, the jury is in. We don't need to do any more messaging. And yet, rates of supplement sales go up every year. So there is a lot of good science, but in the case of vitamins, it's hard to get it out there. What about questions like water? Well, most of the information, we all have this idea that it's good to drink six cups a day. So we tried, started to investigate this for Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. Very hard to get good data that isn't from water companies until I found this review, which details wonderfully how drinking lots of water is beneficial for your kidneys, it prevents urinary tract infections, it prevents urinary tract malignancies. It's wonderfully easy to read, it's clearly written, it's in an excellent peer-reviewed journal. But there was one little phrase that kind of stuck in my mind. Interestingly, the increased risk of cancer was associated with intake of tap water, but not for non-tap water, which suggests that carcinogenic chemicals in tap water may explain the increased risk. If you go to the end of the article, this supplement is sponsored by Danon Research France. Medical writing assistance has been provided by Alan Pedder, funded by Danon. Now, I am not saying that the owner of the largest mineral water companies in the entire world <laughs> and the writing assistance they provided had any influence on what this paper said. And nor am I saying that the honoraria that the, the other authors received from Danon Research had any impact on the clinical findings. I am not saying that in this filmed public lecture. <laughs> so... Um, Diet. What about diet? We made a horizon on fat versus sugar, and that kind of fell out the same way. You can make two stacks of papers. This is a paper, this is a, a very nice meta-analysis from an excellent journal done by good people uh, about um, how saturated fat is not linked to cardiovascular disease. And if you look at the author's details, you get where they are, and they're all at good places. Uh, number four, kind of buried in the middle there, supported by the National Dairy Council. Now, you can build two stacks of papers, one of which is funded by essentially the Corn Refiners Association of America. The other stack of papers is funded by the Dairy Association or the Beef, beef Farmers. And you're left with two schools of thought that either sugar or fat is highly toxic. All of it's a bit moot because as, we, as the program went out, studies showing that protein is highly toxic as well came out. So, uh, so we come back to this idea, all, new, all macronutrients are bad. It's all, all sources of calories are bad. The onion usually nails these things pretty well, doesn't it? The world death rate holds at 100%. All food is bad for you. Life is a fatal condition. More science that your grandmother could have told you. There's very little in the onion that's wrong. Diet and weight loss. So, so I, I'm endlessly making programs about diet and weight loss. Very hard to say anything very conclusive, but we, we keep making them. I think, just to resort back to the onion, this is probably the state of the science in diet and weight loss. 
and we fiddle around the edges. We think that some people benefit from diets more than other people. Almost all diet studies last three to six months. There's very, very little long-term follow-up. Dieting is a life, uh, obesity is a lifelong problem. It's not just the Daily Mail. Did everyone see this a few months ago? Processed meats rank, they don't just rank alongside smoking, they rank alongside polonium as a cause of cancer. On the same day, this article was also published. <laughs> So it's, what's, what's good for the goose is not always good for the gander. Data doesn't have the resolution to tell you what's good for you, and it won't for a long time. So we have some confusion. And this is weird, because science works, doesn't it? Well, actually, earlier on this summer, there was a lovely study in science where they tried to reproduce studies in, in psychology. And they found they could only reproduce 36% 33, 33, of studies. So maybe the Daily Mail and the Guardian and the papers have been softening us all up for this impending crisis in science, the thing that, that scientists have kind of known about. And they've actually done very good dispassionate reporting. But we've accumulated a mountain of semi-conscious or unconscious <coughs> lies through the amplification of a million biased experiments. The interesting thing about the lies is not the fiction that they create, but the holes they leave in the truth. And a guy called John Ioannidis explains this best. About This is a wonderful paper that, that everyone should read. And he, he does some modeling about why most published research finding, findings are wrong. And I think anyone who runs a weekly journal club would kind of agree. Our lab journal club, we only review Nature, Science, and Cell now. And I'd say eight times out of ten, we, we pretty strongly disagree with the results. And when we do agree, we say, well, they probably faked it. and It'll be retracted. What about Richard Dawkins' own area. So he does kinship selection. He does the selfish gene. So maybe he, if he's stuck within his own thing, he could have this level of dogmatic certainty. The selfish gene essentially says, or kinship selection theory says, the, the biologist J.B.S. Haldane said it best, I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. You take a risk according to your relatedness to the person you're taking the risk for. And that explains so, social behavior in animals, altruism. Last summer, famous biologist at Harvard published a paper demolishing the selfish gene concept. And I'd love, demolishing and maybe slightly overstating it, but, but E.O. Wilson, an enormously eminent evolutionary biologist, um, published a paper that, that really ran contrary to it. And this is kind of my area. I work in genetics and evolutionary biology. And it's, it's immensely difficult to explain to anyone the argument between these two people, but so I'll just let, I'll let E.O. Wilson explain what he thinks. I know you've had quite a big history with Richard Dawkins and a different view of the natural selection process. Where are we on that now, in your view? Uh, there is no dispute between me and Richard Dawkins, and never has been, because uh, he's a journalist, uh, and journalists are uh, people who report what the scientists have found. Uh, and the arguments I've had uh, have actually been with scientists doing research. Pretty damning, isn't it? It's pretty damning. So I, 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 I'm not going to try and find my way through that. We, there is a big discourse, and, and, and I think both theories stand and both have it. It's worth saying this isn't Richard Dawkins and E.O. Wilson. This is uh, two other scientists. <laughs> So we've got some, some big, slightly vague topics with industrial interests. We've got some, the, the petty narcissism of academic arguments. What about the stuff that actually matters to us all, right? What about medicine itself? If you, if you base medicine on, on science, you cure people. Yeah. We all, we all go along with that. I'm a doctor. I work in one of the leading teaching hospitals in Europe, possibly the world. Uh, I prescribe drugs. I'm not going to get into big pharma. That's low-hanging fruit. We almost came close in this country a few weeks ago to a doctor's strike last week. What happens when doctors go on strike? This is an interesting hole in the truth, isn't it? Despite industrial action by doctors, which closed all regular hospital and sick fund clinics, there was no increase in mortality. A meta-analysis in the Journal of Social Science and Medicine in 2008 uh, studied five doctor strikes for which there were, there were available data and found that in every single one, Mortality decreased, apart from one instance. And this, this particularly, I particularly like this paper. So this is in, in JAMA, where um, some doctors investigated mortality rates 
um, during, uh, for cardiology conditions when cardiologists are away at conferences in presumably Hawaii. I don't, I, I'm an infectious diseases doctor, so we don't have conferences in exotic places. We go to Birmingham. But, um, so the cardiologists go away, and uh, high-risk patients with heart failure and cardiac arrest hospitalized in teaching hospitals had a lower 30-day mortality than admitting during dates of national cardiology meetings. So, it's tricky, isn't it? I'm not saying medicine doesn't work, but maybe we should all be feeling a little bit uncomfortable. How do we grapple with the truth? How do we make programs about truth? How do we find a monopoly? So maybe it's because we fall into some different camps. Who, who here is a scientist, by which I mean has a science degree or identifies scientists? And who here is an artist, has an arts degree or a humanities degree? Now, I've kind of wrong-footed you there, but you've, we divide ourselves into tribes, don't we? So maybe the tribes could be represented by Alan Sokal, who's a physicist in New York, and Michel Foucault, who's the father of post-structuralism. This kind of quote is immensely difficult to read. This is Foucault on truth. He's saying that at the factual level, something that isn't true, but which refers to another deeper meaning, which cannot be assimilated in terms of precision and observation. Things can be true and not true. Very hard to understand that. And it angered Alan Sokal so much, this kind of thought that was going through academic campuses in the 60s and the 70s, that he submitted a paper about how gravity was just a social construct. And this got published and critiqued. And, uh, and then he said, actually, I was just taking the mickey. And anyone who believes gravity is a social construct is invited to come and test it from the window of my office, which sits on the 22nd floor <laughs> of a skyscraper in New York. And in lampooning uh, uh, this sort of postmodernist thought, Sokal had an explicitly political objective. He believed that being uncertain about truth was very dangerous, politically dangerous. This is out from Harold Pinter's, the beginning of his Nobel Prize speech. There are no hard distinctions between what is real and unreal, nor between what is true and false. The thing is not necessarily either. Now, that kind of statement is very difficult um, if you are uh, a scientist, it's very difficult to, to understand. Um, and he went on to say that that was applied through the discussion of reality through art, which is fundamentally what television is. He went on to say he didn't believe that statement held true when it came to discussing politics. So we've got three ways of thinking about these things. How do we do it? So kids' television is a very nice way of thinking about children's truth. This is how sneezing supposedly works. This is what all textbooks will tell you about sneezing. You raise your um, or pharynx and you expel particles out your nose. When we film a sneeze, however... Every single one of those droplets could have contained disease-spreading germs. Nothing comes, nothing comes out your nose at all, okay? So we had a problem. We had to go through and find out why do we sneeze. And there's only one good paper on why you sneeze in the entire literature. I, I, I would say, I would say, that there'll be an ENT surgeon who wants to object to me. So we did some, uh, we did some experiments, and we measured nasopharyngeal pressure, and we created a painting. And what you find is that the reason you sneeze, nothing comes out your nose when you sneeze, unless you, unless you stop it. And we've all then had that snot coming out the nose thing. When you sneeze, it's the pressure rise in your pharyngeal cavity that stimulates the release of mucus. And what you then get is this not being flushed out. So there are some th simple things we discuss. Children's television is, is, is quite simple. And the reason is we're not trying to talk about new stuff. We're not trying to communicate things that are at the edge of science. We're talking about stuff we already know. And it can be difficult, but we generally get there in the end. But television is social engineering. And we do have problems when it comes to talking about more complex things. So ocular plastic surgery, correcting strabismus or squint, it's an aesthetic operation. It's simply about turning someone into someone who's normal. You don't get any gain in eyesight. So how do we celebrate the return of one child to the appearance of normality when not all children can have that? How do we do that without marginalizing those other kids? How does someone who is legless get prostheses without betraying himself and the wider community of legless people? That feels weird, doesn't it? If you follow that train of thought to the end of the line, and that's where television's very good at mixing that subjectivity about how we can marginalize a community of people by publicizing a piece of clear, objective science. That's where that artistic view comes in really useful. 
and television's good at bridging that divide. I want to wrap up. I've got to wrap up at got five minutes of my. I want to wrap up by talking about homeopathy because I'm about to make a program for BBC One called um, Too Much Medicine. All medicine does harm, all of it. It's about balancing risks and harms. So this is the NHS website, Stated View on Homeopathy, which I broadly agree with. I, I do not like the phrase, the settled view of medical science. I'm not sure we should have any settled view, but I, I broadly agree with this. And it costs the NHS, and uh, UCH Trust um, funds it, I think, still, three million pounds a year. Amazing, isn't it? What if you compare that, though, to tonsillectomy? So this is a monitor health report. 95% of tonsillectomies and knee washouts and jaw replacements are unnecessary. And they're much more violent than homeopathy. They'll cause a lot of mortality as well. And they cost 600 million. So what information could we get from other disciplines? By turning outside our own scientific viewpoint and looking to, say, anthropologists, what might we understand about how the campaign to eradicate homeopathy from the NHS will marginalize a community of people. Will it make people who believe in homeopathy more or less likely to seek medical help when they're ill? Will it make them more or less likely to have babies in NHS hospitals? Will it make them more or, more or less likely to vaccinate their kids? We'll save three million pounds. What pieces will we have to pick up first? Because the science conflicted with the social science, with the anthropology. I don't have a clear answer. But I'm going to leave you with a final, a final clip to bookend the talk. From the, uh, well, that's last theorem. Oh, that kind of television will always live on. It's infinite. It's not seeking some truth. It's seeking to expose you to a community. The kind of programs I do, I guess, I think are very valuable because they expose me to people who have different ways of understanding the world. When we privilege scientific information over other forms of knowledge, we lose something really important because those numbers have no categories to describe things like suffering. And television is excellent at doing that. And when we integrate art and science and artists and scientists, together I think they create new ways of understanding the world. And we've reached this point where now we can use television start to critique as well as celebrate science. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Um, we can take some questions now. So, anybody want to show your hands? Um, okay. Is this going to be an evolutionary biology question? Um, that was very interesting because... Um, I've been pondering about whether to have a root canal today. Um, and I've read in the newspaper that it gives you Alzheimer's. That was the latest. It came, so, um, and then you'd all miss my questions. Um, but I do remember when I did my first degree at UCL, um, I, none of us could sleep because it's not like today when you used to have six hours a week. We had six hours a day and you had to learn every law off. And we couldn't sleep. And I went to see my doctor, so he gave me a Mandrex tablet the night before an exam. And I have to say that the next day I fell asleep during the exam, and it's the only exam I've ever failed in my life. And so did a few other students. And I saw in his desk that he'd been given these presents from Mandrex. And the other thing I want to bring into this, that if, I think it ch that was in the late 70s, so I'm older than I look, I, I hope. I don't even know what Mandrex is, it sounds amazing. Um, no, it's now on the dangerous drug list because I then became a barrister and had to defend people for um, selling Mandrex. So, I, you know, I remembered that. And then um, statins is another thing I'm puzzled with because I'm as fit as a fiddle. I mean, I walk everywhere, I don't eat meat, um, I don't smoke and all that, and I'm really fit. And my doctor says I'm fit, but everybody's trying to make me take statins because I've got high cholesterol. And I met um, a consultant from Australia, and he said, but we don't even know what statins are in Australia, and we've got a higher, you know, a higher life rate than you. So can you, more than anything else, can you give me advice on the statins? Because 
my cholesterol is like seven and they're trying to make me get my heart tested in case I drop dead within Please. 10 years from statins. So that's what I leave you. And it was a very interesting lecture. I'm sorry I was five minutes late. No, no, that, that's right. That's right. Uh, I'm not going to give you any advice on statins because I'm, I'm an infection doctor. But I, I will say I think statins are the paradigmatic example of... of two conflicting pieces of information. So that they are, statins encapsulate a lot of the problems that I think we need to discuss. The value of, of we can improve mortality, but trials, trials are a limited tool that find it. It hurts the muscle, gives you diabetes, yeah. it's balancing it, and it's terrifying to be in Yeah, I, I don't have a clear view. I just think we should ask the questions about statins. And there are some excellent cardiologists who will put you on statins and some excellent ones who won't. And, and, it's, and we, we need to be slightly more open-minded that some people probably should be on them and some people shouldn't. I, I'm dodging the bullet there because I'm just going to refuse to give any medical advice unless it is about um, HIV. Okay. And I, even that, I'm not going to give any HIV advice. Okay. Anybody else got a question? Okay, we'll come back to you. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gijs Kleiter from the Netherlands. Uh, I, I just have a more general question. So, um, you know, a as a famous doctor, how do you perceive the perception of doctors? Because I guess it has changed over times. So when, for instance, we have um, TV series about doctors, we have talk shows like you mentioned. And I guess there's a kind of gradual transformation over time when you compare, for instance, Dr. Kale there with ER and, and Nash, uh, Mesh, sorry, and such. And I'm just wondering, what do you think of the current perception of a doctor? Is he considered to be a trustworthy person? Uh, sometimes he's I described as a half god, you know, almost perfect. <laughs> So I guess that there are two things. There's what I think. So there's there's three things, really, because I'm I'm not a famous doctor. I'm a famous. I'm not really famous, but I'm, I'm known for being a television presenter, but I have a medical degree. As a doctor, I'm not famous at all. There's what it should be and what it is. I don't know. I, I feel like maybe my talk is partly saying we should, we should have a little bit less certainty about medicine. And I, I can't tell if we're... I think we're going in two ways. Some people are becoming ever more certain about the science. But I think the voices critiquing it are becoming more certain as well. So the Too Much Medicine program, for example, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges have said, yes, overprescription is an enormous problem. Overprescription may be between the third and the sixth leading cause of death in the Western world. I mean, that is staggering. At the same time, the president of the Academy of Royal Colleges is saying that we should be prescribing more drugs as important public health measure because prevention is better than cure and we know that prevention works and we have the data to prove it. There's nuance between the those two positions, and I, I think the best thing we can do is have an argument, but I can't, I can't give you, I, don't, I certainly don't have a monopoly on truth, and I would be very nervous about anyone who did. I'm dodging all these questions, aren't I? Sorry, that's... Thank you, the lady. Shell, shell. Mm. Why do you think... Um, Why is it all wrong? Uh, well, my question was going to be, why do you think that, so, that journalists and the media are so um, quick to jump on extremes or to interpret Honestly, I think the extremes? media's been... Re been resp it's like a Mel Brooks film. If you ever see, you watch Blazing Saddles or any of his films, and they're, they're full of racism and sexism, but he's, he's equally vile about everyone, and it's very democratic. And, and I think the, the media approach to particularly medical science has just been, yeah, okay, you say it causes cancer, fine, we'll write that today. Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay, we'll write that tomorrow. And we're not, we're not going to have an editorial on it. We're just going to say, this study showed this. And actually, when you read that Huffington Post article, it's pretty good. Yeah, the headline's a bit weird, but that makes you read the article. And all the headlines in both directions are equally sensational. And it comes from the science. And journals, you know, as someone in a lab who wants to publish papers, Journals don't want to publish negative data. And, and that's because scientists don't want to read it. And so it, it, this is a whole discussion that scientists have long been aware of, and I'm, I'm a very bad commentator on it.
but it's not, it's not the ignorance of the press. The press, there are good scientific journalists who are picking up on the work of, of good scientists. There's no, there's no one to blame, but we could change the system a little bit. We could tweak things. So Fiona Godley at the BMJ, for example, um, the BMJ is considering or, or has discussed the idea of not publishing anything funded by drugs companies. I don't know if that's good or bad. There are, presumably there are some good trials, but th there is a huge amount of anxiety about all data that has any links to industrial funding. Thank you. It's time for one more question. Um, I just wondered, given I, I was absolutely mortified to, to discover some years ago that science, that um, medicine was not an exact science. Right. Shot my so life was I. Apart. Uh, but that, that aside, um, how do you approach these problems with your um, first year undergraduates, for example, your medical um, students? Um, so we, I gave a tutorial yesterday, which I based, or last week rather, I based entirely on, uh, on Charlie Sheen. So we try and take an example from the real world and explore its social meaning. And that enabled us to get from the molecular biology of HIV and its transmission all the way through to the implications of diseases that infect celebrities and stigma. And we try not to have too much dogma, but we, we encourage them to, to think. I think UCL is very, very good at encouraging them to think. And medical school has changed. So I went to Oxford, which was extremely dogmatic. And it was a very scientific training. And we were just taught facts. The knee bone is essentially connected to the thigh bone. And medical school doesn't, did not previously teach you a very much more sophisticated analysis of the human condition than that those two bones are connected. And I think now we do incorporate anthropology and we do incorporate social science and we do incorporate the idea that, that we can have shared decision making. So we used to tell patients what to do and now there is an entire practice of how to make a decision with a patient that's right for the patient. And if the patient doesn't want their chemotherapy or their statin, whatever they don't want, there is a way of negotiating that discussion. Because they may, they may be wrong. You are still the expert, but you shouldn't be necessarily trying to persuade them. You should be trying to get them to gain the maximum understanding. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Very complicated things, aren't they? Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of today's lunch hour lecture. We'll be back on the 19th of January. I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Chris Van Tullikin. Thank you.